pressure to discover all we can know about our past, about the history of Jesus, about the physical universe, as a cathartic way of disciplining our imaginations. Robert Funk, West Star Founder. West Star is not a religion. It's not a church. It makes no theological claims. So it's really a scholarship in public for the public. It owes no one anything except to search for the truth fearlessly. What we do is try to identify important issues about the Bible that also make a difference in the culture so that our scholarly work that actually matters Oh, that's amazing. For example, there's no mention in the Bible of homosexuality, zero. These ideas that men are the only apostles, there's no evidence of that in the New Testament. Women actually had authority. You do not have to believe that God is the big owner of all that is, including your reproductive system. You don't have to subscribe to that. And if you don't subscribe to that, you're not at odds with the Bible any more than the people who do subscribe to that. From clergy, I get, I can't tell my people this. And from the folks in the pew, I get, why didn't anybody ever tell me this? There's a kind of conspiracy of silence out there. It is the book. So what does it mean to have a book that's so powerful in our culture that is yet such a, a blank set for most people? What's happened throughout the history of, of the, the Bible in America is that anybody who picks up the Bible and reads a verse comes away with an interpretation. We have over 5,000 different Christian denominations in this country because every different interpretation spawns a different group. We have a threefold primary responsibility. Number one, get people saved. Number two, get them baptized. Number three, get them registered to vote. People can pick whatever passages they want outside of the context in which they were written, and they can get any meaning from those scriptures, those texts that they wish. That's very, very, very dangerous. In that kind of a religious world, the Bible justifies everything from settlements on the West Bank to shooting up abortion clinics and a whole lot of stuff in between. What Bob wanted to do was to break out of the ghetto of the church and get on to the cultural agenda. He was convinced that Religious literacy and biblical literacy in particular were very, very low in the United States. Funk just thought this was intolerable. He was just absolutely apoplectic about this. How could he have spent 40 years of his life educating students about the Bible, and yet the world around us has no idea what we're talking about? So Funk said, we have to go public. We have to have these conversations in public. Bob said, well, we should start a Jesus seminar and invite anyone in scholarship who might be interested. Everybody who was a New Testament scholar knew who Bob Funk was. When he extends this invitation to come and try this enterprise, you paid attention. So we began to have conversations in public about, did Jesus say the Lord's Prayer? Or did he not say the Lord's Prayer? But at the end, here's what Bob said. I don't want a big discussion, and at the end, everyone goes their way. You're going to have to vote on it. Please go ahead and make your votes. A lot of people were offended that the scholars would vote on the authenticity of Jesus' words by casting colored beads. 
from the church's point of view, you're going to vote on the truth. The publications of Westar is intrinsically related to the entire purpose of Westar, to make a report to the public. We were categorized as heretics. And that didn't surprise us. We, we expected that. The Jesus Seminar was never just about the historical Jesus. It was empowering people with the right to ask questions. If you can question Jesus, you can question and should question everything. Our institute has been about going back to the sources, drawing on the best of contemporary scholarship to rethink the religious traditions that shape our identity. Archaeology is generating fresh sources of evidence that we didn't have previously. So in this case, below the French convent, below the Crusader church, below the Byzantine church, we come to a first century home may or may not have been Jesus' home. We know they used um, stone vessels because of Jewish ritual purity. So we discover that Jesus grows up in a community which is self-consciously and intentionally Jewish and Torah-observant, temple-centered Jewish. When historical Jesus studies were mostly based on literature, including Josephus, and the Gospels. We began to get a Jesus that was much more Hellenistic, who was in opposition to the temple. With that kind of perspective on Jesus, he's a prophet of Israel, but he's an opponent of Judaism. And if that's taken too far, it becomes a cipher for anti-Semitism as well. And because of the research coming out of the Galilee in the last 20 or 30 years, I think we're beginning to get a much better snapshot of Jesus as a Jewish Galilean. Most people would be very surprised to understand that Christianity doesn't come with Jesus. They'd be very surprised to find out it starts in the fourth century. The Christianity Seminar is really envisioned as kind of the aftermath of the Jesus Seminar. If you figure out what Jesus is about, now how do you figure out what Christianity is about, what came afterwards? Westar is not just about, we're gonna tell you the right answer. We're saying, you need to know how to read the texts. You need to appreciate the context of when they were written. They were written in the Roman Empire. So what did that mean? In fact, everything in the Bible was written to someone else for some other purpose in another culture, time and place that we have largely lost. So we're in the position always as interpreters of the gospel, being on our knees, listening through a keyhole to an ancient conversation not intended for us. When the languages range over six or seven and the texts are scattered everywhere, you need the requisite amount of expertise. And being able to do it collectively really allows things that look tangential to suddenly spark an aha moment from the fellows themselves. What we're working on in the Christianity Seminar is how to connect the terrible violence in the Roman Empire against most of the population and how the texts of the early Christ movements were resistance to that. We think of the Bible being this bound book, but in antiquity, different communities would have different versions of the text that would probably relate to what their situation was. One of the things that's great about Wester is that it's really taking early Christian literature found at Nag Hammadi seriously and using them with the same kind of authority, so to speak, as what's in the canon. I had to learn my sixth ancient language because most of this was in Coptic. Celine, Lily, and I learned Coptic together. 
and she's way better than I now. And so what we were looking at today, the Thunder Perfect Mind, I mean, it's the picture of this divine female character. So if we are able to get something like Thunder out, you know, mm -hmm. then people have all these access points suddenly. So it allows us a connection that's like 2,000 years old. Natalie Perkins is a well-known theater and musical professional. But in the middle of all that, she decided to go to seminary, but got bit by the possibility of the Bible being larger than what the Bible is, and noticing that that was a way into spiritual conversations with a larger public. Putting things in music forces people to deal with things in a communal way, which I think Thunder is about. And, and, and maybe this button. What Westar can do for the millennial generation especially is to say, here's the historical picture in a little bit more detail. Here's how you can open up the story. Is that power? That's what I imagine it was. Yeah. It was power? Yeah. <laughs> As a parish minister, West Star for me certainly created an understanding that the gospel is political. It is not partisan, but it is very political. Jesus is a political figure. Good evening and welcome to Mayflower Church on this Ash Wednesday. Will you bow your heads with me? We're very worried about being nice these days, but Jesus was not interested in that. This is non-violent resistance. This is really serious, turn the empire upside down kind of work. Ash Wednesday is a reminder to do what you can while you're here. The ancient ritual we practice tonight is a reminder that we don't have unlimited time. We are all marked for death, it's true, but we are also given the opportunity to live fearlessly to love faithfully and to resist injustice for as long as we draw breath. Nine churches on average per day close in the United States. That doesn't worry me. That doesn't worry me. Social justice churches will thrive, especially now. If the church isn't the center of resistance, it isn't being the church. We are here to support our Muslim brothers and sisters as they access the people's house. This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. We're acting out of what I call the politics of the gospel. That's one of the things that I've enjoyed the most about being part of Westar, is to try to bridge that world between scholars and pastors. We care about justice, equality, and the future of humanity. And if religion becomes a barrier to justice, equality, and the future of humanity, it loses any value. We don't know where we're going, but we'll get there. Like George Harrison said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. <laughs> the visits of scholars to churches is actually called Jesus Seminar on the Road, no matter what seminar it's with. <laughs> Two scholars go to a faith community that's invited them and do lectures and conversations. Now we're doing God. We certainly do need to find a new way to talk about God, if that word is gonna be a viable word in the human future. Welcome to 
Welcome to Chicago. Thank you. How is your be flight? Very eventful. Really? Yes. Good. I'm Reverend Tom Capo. I'm the minister here at DuPage Unitarian Universalist Church, and I want to welcome you tonight to Jesus Seminar on the Road. Hello, thank you for letting me speak with you this weekend. I'm really looking forward to our time together. When I got the invitation from David to be part of the God Seminar, I was utterly befuddled. Jesus was a real person. When it comes to God, what do we have? except a bunch of ideas. The God question is not an evidence question, but the statements about God have to be consistent with evidence. Our work is collaboration. It's an extended conversation. We give you the imaginative habits of thought, imaginative habits of engagement that say you don't have to think by yourself. When I went to my first meeting at Santa Rosa, I was really impressed by in the long-term commitment so many of the scholars made to Westar to make the conversation work. That's Westar's place to find the common ground rather than divisions. Westar is conversations of urgency, hope, and intellectual integrity what Christians think their religion is about matters. It matters in how they imagine the world. It matters in how they imagine where the world is going. That shapes our common life together. It shapes our society very, very profoundly. I'm gonna read the two ballot items and then we have our beads here and we are going to vote. I mean, scholarship's a moving target. It's not located in a single individual. It's an ongoing process of learning. Learning never ends and it's never perfect. These things fascinate people and they deserve to have all the information about them they can possibly get. And who's gonna get that information for them? Scholars are going to do that. <laughs> 